Tenemos el privilegio de tener hoy aquí a una eminencia con el profesor Carlos Ratti. Él es arquitecto, él es ingeniero, él es inventor, él es profesor del MIT, donde dirige MIT Sensible City, donde están estudiando el impacto de todas las tecnologías en la ciudad del futuro. Él ha sido seleccionado de las 50 personas que cambiarán el mundo por la revista Wired Magazine. Muchas gracias. Bienvenuti. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Could I have the clicker? Is this one? Yeah. All right. Um, all right, good morning, everybody. So, um, good afternoon. Uh, a great pleasure to be with you here today in, uh, in Madrid. Um, so, what I, I want to do today with you was to share some of the work we were doing both at MIT Sensible City Lab and um, also in our design office, Carlo Ratti Sociati, using a lot of data in looking at how this can transform cities or buildings. And uh, just before I had, um, I had an interview this morning and somebody asked me about this kind of analogy I did once about Formula One. So he added back this slide. Um, and I hadn't used it for a few, for some time. But in Formula One, because something quite interesting happened in Formula One over the past 10, 20 years. 10, 20 years ago, if you wanted to win a race, you needed a good car and a good driver. The physical infrastructure was the key, most important thing. But today, if you want to win a race, you also need a very big digital infrastructure, something like this, with thousands and thousands of sensors onto the car, collecting information in real time, sending information to those computers where it's, it's analyzed, it's processed, and decisions are made in real time. If you want, this is not the nice that real time big data collected from the car, analyzed and processed, and used in order to, to win the race. And for those, all of us who are uh, engineers, it's a very basic real time control system. It's a system made of two components, a sensing component and an actuating component. And sensing and actuating is really what most dynamic systems do, what most living systems do. When we meet each other, we sense each other, we collect information from each other, and then we use this information in order to, to make decisions and respond to that information. So sensing and actuating. Now, the amazing thing today, we believe, is that our cities have been layered with sensors, with networks, with many other different types of digital systems. And because of that, they're starting to behave a little bit like that Formula One racing cars. car. If you want, it's like uh, the internet is entering physical space, it's becoming internet of things, and so it's transforming the way we can actually collect information from the city and respond to that information. Just one example out of many, if you look at this, you see the progression of uh, mobile connections on the planet from the beginning. Now, it might seem surprising today to think that there was a time, uh, just in 1979 is the first commercial cell phone network in Japan by NTT. There was a time when we could live without mobile connections. And then it took 20 years to get to 1 billion, and then up there to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, now 7 billion. You may say there's 7 billion people on the planet. How much more could this grow? Well, according to most predictions, we are somewhere here, and then we'll be at 50 billion by, by 2020. And the reason for that is that we started collect, connecting people with people, and then more and more people with data, people with machine with data, and increasingly M to M, machines to machine, things talking to other things, almost as if every atom out there of the physical world were becoming both a sensor and, uh, and an actuator. Now, um, all of this has many consequences, and of course the consequence, the key consequence, is that this produces a huge amount of, of data. And you know, that's uh, one of the many statistics, you can find many of them, but 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone. That's, uh, that's quite striking. There's another definition of big data I like, uh, and you know, you've been talking a lot about this uh, this morning, is by a friend and colleague at uh, University College in London, Mike Batty. And Mike says, uh, big data is what you cannot put in an Excel spreadsheet. And actually, this definition is quite profound. When we've got big data, you cannot use standard tools. You need new tools to store it, to visualize it, and to analyze it. So if you want, you know, big data is also what goes beyond the, the, the basic data we normally use into some dimension that require specific tools. So what I wanted to do with you today was to share with you some um, uh, examples of, uh, of data. Um, and I classified into three types of data. Opportunistic is the data that we can collect in an opportunistic way from the city. There's a lot of smart city, smart meter data, for instance. We're working with State Grid in China. They have a, they, smart meter data from 100 million customers. If you analyze it, you can do amazing things with, uh, with data information. Many other types of data. If you look at this, you know, it's um, a city like we couldn't see just a few years ago. 
That is the city of Lisbon, captured using billions and billions of data points based on GPSs on taxis. And again, you know, we couldn't see a city like this as a living organism just a few years ago, but, but we can today. And if you take this data from taxis and you analyze it, you can do interesting things. It's the same data as before. Every dot is somebody who jumps on a taxi or gets off a taxi. So it's a pick-up and drop-offs. In this case, it's not Lisbon anymore. It's New York. You see JFK Airport, and then you can zoom out. You see the airport was down here. You see all of Manhattan and the boroughs. If you look at the map in detail, actually, on that map, there's no streets. But on that map, all the streets just emerge because there's so many pick-ups and drop-offs everywhere. So the map is, is totally black. But when you map all the things, you see all the streets emerge just because of all the pickups and the drop-offs. Well, you know, if you, if you take this, then you can ask yourself, you know, what if people could actually share mobility more? Um, these days, we like to share many things in our lives. We like to share apartments on Airbnb, couches on couch surfing platforms. So what if people were ready to share mobility more? And if you look at two points, uh, between those two points, you've got hundreds of thousands of uh, trips that could potentially be shared in Manhattan in the course of the year. So our question was, you know, imagine mathematically, imagine you want to take everybody to destination exactly when they need to be there, then what is the minimum number of vehicles that you need to, to do that? And you might tolerate a little delay on the system, you call it a delta, it could be one minute or two minutes, but still based on that delay, what is the minimum number of cars you need to satisfy the mobility demand of, uh, of New York? Now if you want to answer that question, again, you know, traditional mathematics fails simply because you've got too much data. So you need to look at different ways. What we found here is a way we call shareability network, networks. So we use network science in order to understand how many of those trips could be shared. Here you see this network of shareability that tells you know, how many trips could be combined potentially and, and the amount of them that could be shared. Now what you find when you run the, the calculations, then um, it's quite extraordinary that in New York, you could actually take everybody to destination exactly when they need to be there, give or take a couple of minutes, but with 40% less cars than, than what we have today. Well, the paper I just showed you, the, if you're interested, is online. It's, uh, it's, from, it's from last year. But the first results came out before that we did at the lab. Uh, those results came to the attention of Uber. And since then, we started collaborating with Uber. As you might know, Uber Pool does exactly this, allows people to share two trips. And we're very excited to, to see just recently that Uber Pool has allowed 100 million trips to be shared. Those 100 million trips are 100 million trips removed from our streets because you take two trips and you combine them into one. Uh, it means you know, much less congestion, pollution, emissions on our roads, and also the potential to, to meet other friends, to create new connections between, uh, between people. Now, this is about uh, sharing what in, in, in technical terms you call ride sharing, so sharing the ride. But uh, what about car sharing? Well, we're all familiar with the car sharing that exists today, the kind of zip car or car to go. But a few years from now, with uh, self-driving, things will change dramatically. That's what the self-driving car sees. The self-driving car scans the environment in 3D, a little bit like human eye. So it creates like a basic 3D model of the environment and uses this information in order to, to navigate and to move on its own. Well, when you go to a self-driving car, everything changes. But the amazing thing is not that you don't need to keep your hands on the steering wheel. You know, that's almost the, the boring stuff. You know, of course, we'll be able to shamelessly text while driving. But that's not the point. The key point is that a self-driving car can give you a lift in the morning when you go to your office, and then can give a lift to somebody else in your family or to anybody else in the city. So what you're doing potentially, you're blurring the distinction between private transportation and in public transportation. You're creating a new hybrid system which is shared and it uses the infrastructure in a much more efficient way. And if you think about how inefficiently the infrastructure is used today, um, you know, cars in the United States are used around 5% of the time, 95% of the time they're just occupying valuable public space uh, in our cities. So if we can increase that 5% to 10 or to 20 or to 50 or maybe one day to even more, then that can have huge repercussions on, on the cities, including the fact that you need much less parking and much less uh, cars to run the mobility needs of a city. Now, if you, if you run the numbers, again, there's a few papers we've done and some of them are still coming out, but in a city such as Madrid or New York or Barcelona, big city or a small city, um, you could actually run the whole city, satisfy the mobility demand of the city, potentially, if you're ready to share, that's a big question, but if you're ready to share, with 20% of the cars we have today. And think about how different Madrid would be if we were to remove eight cars out of 10 and just you know, still be able to take everybody to, to destination.
Now, this, I believe, will happen very, very soon because self-driving is a reality. The technology is there. Already today, you can buy almost self-driving cars. We are working with the government in Singapore to do the first deployment of self-driving cars later this year in Gardens by the Bay. And um, uh, so technology is there. And you know, the, the amazing thing is that you don't need any infrastructure. So just you, know, you can start buying and, share, and, and using self-driving cars, and then this, uh, these dynamics will, uh, will naturally emerge. A few years from now, when uh, everything will become then self-driving or more intelligent, then other things might happen. For instance, this. And um, you're all familiar with this. Um, that's a well-known uh, traffic light. And traffic lights came to our roads when cars came to our roads. But if you think about an intelligent system where everything is self-driving, you, know, you don't need to stop cars anymore. Then you can let cars go and cross the intersection, simply avoiding that they bump into each other. A little bit like this. Don't try yet. <laughs> I gave a presentation a few months ago in Naples, and it told me, so what's new here? Um, and uh, so again, you know, the mathematical is quite interesting. It is something where you want to model the intersection. It's quite simple, but you know, it gets complex when you look at all the possible combination of how cars go one way or the other way. It also becomes complex when you look at the different frequency in the, you know, of how cars are approaching the, the intersection. But if you look at that, uh, that's a paper that came out a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago. You can find something quite interesting. We try to develop a general framework for, for intersections. What you see here, if you can have the, the audio as well, it's not crucial here, but it might be good to, to have it for, for later. Um, what you see here is a real intersection in, um, in uh, Singapore. Um, you got the same number of cars to the left and to the right, getting to the intersection. But to the left, we are using the most sophisticated traffic light that we have today to manage the intersection. And to the right, you got just an intelligent slot-based system. It's based on slots, a little bit like what happens in, in airports. And look at the difference between the two, to the left and to the right. Uh, just with the same number of cars, but the difference in terms of uh, delays and queuing uh, just after a few minutes. So um, again, looking at data that we can use in a, that we can collect in an opportunistic way in our buildings, there's other exciting things we can do. Uh, and this is just one example. I want to start with this, which is um, the idea of how people have been thinking about cities over the past 100 years. Now, in the early 20th century, Le Corbusier, Siam, and all the modernists thought that actually cities should be something where we would divide everything, the place for working, for sleeping, for, for leisure. And then, you know, uh, in a certain sense, this was their model of, uh, of an ideal city. But if you do that, of course, of course is, uh, is a bit absurd, because you create like three cities that are empty most of the time, you use them just to say eight hours for sleeping, and then you move to another neighborhood for working, and so on. And then, and then you create a lot of congestion between them. So it's no surprise that since the 1960s, many people have been thinking and advocating for having mixed use development. So developments where different things come together, and you got a bit of everything combined into the same neighborhood. But perhaps today that is changing again. Perhaps today the same idea that we were talking about before, about sharing better mobility can also apply to space, how space itself in different functions can actually be overlapped and give us a different structure of, uh, of our, the space we live in. Uh, something that changes the mix between public and private in the very structure of, uh, of our um, buildings and cities. So let me be give, give you one example. What you see here is uh, the MIT campus. Um, I'm sorry, Boston is a beautiful green city. Here it looks like post-nuclear explosion, but um, it's, um, it's because it's a winter picture. Um, but you see Boston downtown, you see MIT is like a little city inside the city. Harvard, don't bother, up there. <laughs> and, um, and then MIT was one of the first places in the world to be totally covered by Wi-Fi. And um, that was in the early 2000s. And through that, we saw big changes. People used to work like this and uh, started working more like this. Now, this is a bit extreme. I, I, I look for the most appalling computer room I could find, you know, no daylight and so on. This is a nice sunny day. It's uh, not always the case in the winter when it's minus 20 and snowing. But you get the idea of you know, the changes in the way of working. So our idea was, well, the, the, the network is the reason why we're changing our way of doing things. Um, and so what about monitoring the network to see what is going on? So what about if you monitor the network? Again, opportunistic data collected by the Wi-Fi network to better understand what is going on. 
So we started monitoring all of the access points on campus. You see them here. You see all the information that goes through them at different times of the day. You see the campus wake, here you see the campus waking up and people moving in different parts of, uh, of the campus. Um, if you look at the aggregated activity, it looks like this for MIT. You see this is a Monday morning. People get to MIT around 9 or 10 a.m. Um, 5 p.m., a few people leave, but not that many. Many people keep on working quite late, till 9, 10, 11. Uh, and then in, in, the, in the middle of the night, you still have a lot of activity. And the same thing happens on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday. Not on Friday, like all over the world, all activity slips away in the, in the afternoon. And then Saturday or Sunday are, are like almost two normal days. You remove the nine to five people, they're almost two normal working days, with something quite interesting. Every Sunday night, there's always the little dent. Uh, it's around 9 or 10 p.m., and that's when you say, shit, tomorrow is Monday again. And then you go back to your computer and remember all the things you need to finish for, for the next week. So uh, if you look at that and you analyze it, every space has a signature like this, which is an occupancy signature. So if you take uh, this room, you can see how many people are in this room over time, and then you get a signature like this. And if you analyze all the signatures, and you, again, can do interesting clustering, uh, there's a Fourier transform to look at some of the main frequencies in the occupants, and then you analyze it, what you find is what I was telling you before, the fact that we're getting more activities overlapped over the same physical space. Is we are more free to work in, uh, in different ways, and that is changing the very way we use space in our buildings. It goes in the same direction of what we've seen also next door here. You've got this very interesting co-working space. Well, you know, that's again a way to use space in a more flexible way that wasn't possible just five or 10 years ago, but it becomes possible today. What you get again, you get two things. You get uh, a more sociable environment where people interact more, but also you get something more effective where you can overlap different functions over space and time, and, and so you can use the square foot in a more effective way. And uh, the same thing you can do, this is a project we've done at the Louvre Museum in, um, in, uh, in uh, Paris, where we look at also the flows of people, again, to understand, you know, can you look at the configuration and how the configuration impacts flows and, and how, you know, potentially tomorrow you could change the configuration to, to optimize flows. That's some of the papers on, on this, you know, mobile phone-based mapping of human movement inside uh, the buildings. And what we are doing in our design office, we are applying this in, uh, in a number of projects to see how this can lead you to to design spaces that promote this kind of interaction. That's an outdoor space in Guadalajara, part of a project that was uh, promoted by the former Mexican president Calderon uh, called uh, Digital Creative City, Ciudad Creativa Digital. This idea that really the very space you, you create is an incubator space, that this very flexibility that you have in usage can actually turn into an architecture which is much, much, much more porous. Um, so here is the same space in, in there. Um, we're also working with a number designing a number of co-working spaces that follow the same principle. These are some of the largest in, in Europe. We just, uh, we just finished. Um, and the interesting thing is that when you look at this, you can do something quite exciting. You know occupancy. And uh, so for um, Fiat Chrysler, the, um, the main automotive company, we are doing their headquarters where basically based on knowing where people are, you can do both uh, heating, cooling, and lighting that follow people. So when there's nobody in the room, like this room, then this room, if you think about it, you know, we'll, we'll go, all go out at 3 o'clock and then it will be empty, but still we'll use all of energy in order to cool itself. You know, you will still have all the air flowing in the room. Or the lights in the offices, they're still there even if nobody's there. And so if you do this, you can have a, a building that a little bit like your computer, when you don't use it, it goes on standby. So you save a lot of energy just by, by knowing where occupancy is, and you're going to put the energy just where the people are, not to heat or cool or light empty spaces. All right, so this was about you know, how, what we can do with, uh, with this dimension of data, opportunistic data. We have it anyway, and we can analyze it. Another type of data that's, uh, that's very interesting is data we all generate. Um, is user-generated. So what we do when we post on Facebook, on Twitter, on Flickr, and how all this information also tells us something about uh, buildings and, and cities. Uh, at the lab, we are one of the first places to look at uh, data from Flickr and see how that tells us something about uh, the city. There's a project we did with... Uh, uh, the former mayor of Florence, who now became the prime minister of, uh, of Italy. And he was interested in seeing, you know, tourist flows in, 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 uh, in Florence are very, very important. Uh, and the city spends a lot of money to know where tourists go. But we said, well, you know, instead of uh, doing all these surveys, why don't we look at just, you know, what is online? So we looked at Flickr data. You see here all Tuscany. The bright spot is Florence. Then you zoom into Florence, and you see, you know, some of the main uh, uh, places in uh, Florence, including the, the Duomo and the Ponte Vecchio. Then you can zoom all the way to the level of, of the building. Now, if you want to do something slightly more sophisticated, what you do, you go onto each file, and you take a look at the time stamp when it was taken. And if you do that, then you can create trajectories. 
And so what you see here is the trajectories of people as they move in Tuscany. What you see here is the Italians and the Americans as they move in the country. And now I've got a question for you. You need to raise your hands, OK? So uh, where are the Americans? To the left or to the right? Make up your mind. And let's say you need to make a decision, one or the other. So Americans to the left, raise your hand. OK, cool. Americans to the right? Almost 50-50. Well, Americans are to the left. And, uh, and if you're American, if you go to Italy once every 10 years or once in a lifetime, you will go to some of the main cities, like Genoa, Pisa, or Florence, or Siena. But if you're Italian, you've been to those places plenty of time. And look at how different is the way that Italians go and look for little villages, for small places, hidden gems where, you know, uh, very few people go, but actually you can discover new places there beyond the main, uh, the main spots. Look at this island called Isola del, but it's, uh, it's a beautiful little island where no Americans on Twitter, there, on, on Flickr there, but actually a lot of, um, a lot of Italians. Uh, I want to share with you also something we did, in, uh, uh, we did as a follow-up again with Flickr. This is something our students were really fascinated about. We wanted to see, can you use the picture to say where's the best place to go partying in Barcelona? And so you look at all the parties and how they happen in real time. Um, I believe that they managed even to get a scientific paper approved where they showed a significant correlation between Britons and parties in, uh, in, in the Catalan capital. Very surprising. Um, and you can do something else. Like what you see here, you can actually look at the color of the picture. And then you get something quite simple to um, get like a scan of uh, drought. You know, as drought progresses during the summer, as the country becomes drier, you can look at the core of the picture in order to say something about that. And that becomes interesting as a way to look at the environment. We called it the world's eyes, los ojos del mundo. Look at the environment by boring all the eyes that we, we all have, and then we use it millions and millions of times when we take pictures and analyzing this information to say something about cities or about the environment. Um, another type of data that's, uh, that's quite interesting is data from Twitter. As you know, also Twitter is, uh, is quite exciting as a data set. And um, I'll, uh, I'll show you now what we did by, by actually analyzing um, uh, many million tweets uh, during the Gulf tournament in, in the United States. And here with big data analysis, discover something interesting. That if you look at the length of tweets, it tells you something about how excited people are about an event, which is quite interesting. That correlation really is very, very precise and very strong. Um, so you see, when we tweet, we leave public digital traces. And then you know, we can use this in order to understand human behavior. Here we looked at data from 2012, Gold Masters Tournament, a five-day event with 40 million tweets. Every dot is a tweet. You see the dots here. And the long tweets are at the top, and the short tweets are at the bottom. You can have the, the sound as well. The average is the yellow. And then you see what happens, you know, you go around, people tweet a lot, and the length changes. And when you look at that, when you analyze it mathematically, you see actually some beautiful log normal curves that really reflect the relationship, the logarithmic relationship between the length of tweets and actually the excitement on the system. So how you can use this in order to say something about, uh, you know, about us uh, and about uh, human behavior using all this data we all live every day when we go online. And the final thing I want to share with you is about data we can purposely sense. I want to share with you two or three projects on, on this space. Uh, starting from this project, we started a few years ago, but we had a very interesting development just last month. And we started looking at that computer. If you look at that computer today, today you know everything about it. Every chip in it, you know where it was produced, how it moved on the planet, how it became that machine. But a few years from now, you throw away that computer and you know very little about it. Sometimes this is what happens. A lot of e-waste is shipped illegally to Africa or to Asia, from the United States to Asia, from uh, Europe to Africa. And, uh, and so you know, you know very little about it. So our idea was, what if we could develop a little chip that we put on trash and we start following trash? It's a little bit the same like when you go to hospital, they put a tracer in your blood and they follow it through your body. How to do the same thing at the scale of uh, an entire city? Now, we couldn't find any tags that we could just use off the shelf. So actually what we did, we had to engineer the tag. We did it with uh, Qualcomm, a big chip producer. And, um, and then, uh, you know, we, the, the, the idea of the tag is almost like a miniature cell phone. It has to last for many months, get it location, and send it back. 
This was the first deployment we did in the city of Seattle. This sound a bit uh, louder. But 500 volunteers came with 3,000 pieces of trash. We put a little tag on all of them. And after tagging all of them, we started following them. So here you can see 3,000 objects, the day of deployment. After a couple of days, you see some of the main landfills next to Seattle. But actually, a big surprise, how far stuff started to travel. Sometimes in crazy, unpredictable ways, you get a trace that went all the way to Chicago, then changed its mind and went back to California. <laughs> and still moving after one month or two months, So the Far West Symphony was the right music. So what can you do with this? The first thing you can do, you're an engineer, you're an architect, you get all the data and actually use it to design a more optimized system. Well, over the past decades, we've been optimizing the global supply chain, how things are produced. What about optimizing the global removal chain, how things are then thrown away and recycled? Second thing that's very, very important, especially also in, in energy consumption, is that if you share the data with people, people then know more and can change their behavior. So data itself, if you share it, can become a very powerful agent for change. And I'll give you just one little story. You know, we are sharing all the data to, to volunteers. We then give them questionnaires at the end. You know, most of them said, you know, this really has changed my approach to what I consume and what I throw away. Little story, somebody came to us and said, look, I used to drink water in plastic bottles every day and then throw them away and stop thinking about them. But now after the project, I know that those bottles go a few miles from home, they go to a landfill, they will stay there forever. So because of this, I stopped drinking water in, in plastic bottles. Um, the third thing we discovered is quite interesting, is that you know, we were tracking across the United States, but a lot of waste actually went to ports and then disappeared. It was going to places you know, like ports or other exchange areas, and then we couldn't track it anymore. But unfortunately, these were like miniature cell phones that only would allow us to track inside the United States. So we couldn't track outside the United States. It was like, you know, we only had a domestic data plan, not a global data plan. So we started then at the time um, doing a follow-up project that we just announced uh, last week. Here you see some of the, some of the, some of the funding. That where we put um, uh, some global trackers on waste, and in particular e-waste. And e-waste is, uh, again, a lot of electronic waste, a lot of uh, old CRTs, old computers, and so on. And what we did with this, uh, um, we managed to find a lot of these uh, big routes that go from the United States to Asia, some of them legal, some of them not legal. If you're interested in it, just a couple of weeks ago, PBS, the big national uh, TV station in the United States, did a long program on this, on this project, and on, it went all the way to Asia to see where this stuff was ending up, sometimes in the middle of the forest. Uh, but really how this can actually help us to, to know more at the global scale and perhaps take action. So in this case, what we wanted to do is to highlight some of those routes and make that information open and accessible. It's online. You can look at all the, the objects, what they are, and how they moved on the planet, so that this can actually then help us to fix some of the possible problems we might, uh, we might have. There's a fourth thing, fourth things, thing we discovered, um, and that was more unexpected. That happened when a burglar came to our lab at MIT. And the poor guy stole a lot of things, including tags and computers that tell you where they go. And this is what happened.
All right, um, and um, as a, I want to wrap up with a, a couple of additional things, again, about how we can sense things more and more in our environment. Uh, this is a project we did last year at the World Expo. As you might know, the World Expo was in Milan. It was in Shanghai 2010, 2015 Milan 2020, will be Dubai. And, um, and uh, we had the pleasure and the fortune of doing two pavilions that were open until uh, a few months ago, until uh, the end of last year, so six months ago. And one of the two pavilions was um,